yes, indeed. So first of all, I would like to thank the, thank the organizers for making all this possible. And especially in this in these hard times, there are a lot of people who just you know give up organizing things. And I admire the motivation of like all the organizers here, and, and uh, I think it's a wonderful activity. Um, I actually was hesitating a lot about what I should put into this presentation and what you saw in the abstract, I mean, obviously you didn't read the abstract, but if you by chance did, uh, was something about graded geometric constructions. And I thought actually to talk about the category of that graded manifolds, but then I realized that probably in view of the previous more physics oriented talks, and since it's also Friday afternoon, it would be cruel. Uh, I will still mention some of those things, but I will also um, tell why I was interested in it and why also people in the room could be interested in it. Okay, and I also want to start with, since now they both came, uh, I want to start by saying that actually I am thankful to the Institute uh, because my journey in this subject literally started here. It was in 2007 when Thomas was organizing this Poisson Sigma model and other stuff program. And I attended the lecture of Alexei, I think something on groupoids, something on Dirac Sigma models, like something like that. And that is occupying now me for maybe 15 years. Uh, yeah, some people change since then. <laughs> Thomas, it was not easy to find this picture. He's hiding this picture now. <laughs> yep. So to the talk, uh, as mentioned, I was thinking of doing a lot of uh, categories in uh, Z graded manifolds, uh, but finally I would probably mostly talk about this integration of differential graded Lie algebra problems. But I will still start with something that brought me into this game, some motivation from physics. And uh, the main challenge of this talk is to keep uh, Thomas awake. I think he got a dessert, right? That's it, no? Okay, that would be easier for me. But still, I'm certainly not keeping him awake with uh, spelling out the morphisms of Z-graded manifolds, but maybe I will keep him awake a little bit with the integration problem, since last time he said he was interested. Uh, I think I'm the first who is actually talking about graded manifolds from the mathematical perspective. So I'm sorry for uh, this uh, maybe two elementary introductions, but, but I need to introduce some words. So uh, for me, uh, a graded manifold for the moment will be, well, let's look at this example that people usually give. So you look at the tangent bundle to a smooth manifold, and you just say that the fiber linear coordinates would be of degree one. And that uh, means two things. First of all, when you look at the sheaf of function, functions on this guy, you would be able to count the degrees. Uh, counting means that when you multiply some non-zero degree coordinates, the degrees add up. And the second thing is that these degrees would be responsible for commutation rel relations. So if you have two, uh, let's say, I will sometimes call them real, sometimes smooth, but th that basically means the degree zero coordinates, they just commute as usual and degree non-zero coordinates commute or not depending on the degree. And uh, this degree one thinks anti-commute. Now, when you look at the sheaf of function, functions, there is a very natural uh, way to say what is a homogeneous function. You just count how many thetas you have in the, in the game. And if, you, if it's a homogeneous polynomial in thetas, then you say it's a degree function. And on these functions, you also know what is the commutation relation. So you have two non-zero degree functions, you get a minus sign up to some power when you permute them. I think all of you are used to this. I don't really need to spell these things out. And you also know that obviously this is the way 
to characterize the exterior algebra. Right, so these these uh, things are just graphically differential forms. Right. Um, I'm telling this because for the moment that will be a kind of definition of a graded manifold. So some manifold with, uh, and I'm specifying that it is a Z grading defined on the shift of uh, functions on it. Um, Z grading for the moment in contrast to Z2 grading. So I'm really, I really want to count the degrees. I don't uh, like saying if they are odd or even is not enough for me. I really need to count them. Uh, and in the maybe in the second half of the talk, it will be also important if it's Z graded or N graded. And also, I think in the talk of Alexander right after that, it will be also an important detail. And we will see. I hope I will have time for this. We will see that sometimes in the Z graded case, you get a much more complicated constructions than in the N graded case, right? Um, now, as you obviously know, there was a lot of work on this, uh, on this uh, graded business. For example, to turn this kind of definition to real definition and Normally you don't read this slide, ah, it's, it's supposed to be small enough, but actually the quality is good enough to read it. <laughs> the, what you are supposed to read is for the moment is this, right? Graded manifolds are just manifolds with some decorations on them. And these decorations for the moment are responsible for signs and they are responsible for distinguishing classes of functions. Uh, and the uh, short message is that you can actually do a lot of things on graded manifolds that you are used to do on just smooth differential manifolds. Uh, then there are also things that you obviously cannot do on graded manifolds. And there is also a thin layer where you don't know. And this thin layer is a matter of uh, a lot of research. And precisely the integration problem is somehow in this thin layer where you know that a lot of things work, but you need to struggle to make them work. Um, now I need to introduce another word, which is by chance in the title of the program. So Q manifolds or Q structures. I'm again in this uh, simple example of uh, tangent bundle to a smooth manifold and I say that I want to look at a very particular vector field on it like this one. Uh, I differentiate by degree zero coordinates and the coefficients are degree one coordinates. So this is obviously degree one vector field and it has some nice properties. So first of all, uh, it satisfies some kind of uh, graded uh, Leibniz identity, right? You differentiate the product, you get some signs that appear, but it's as usual, the sum of two terms. And it is self-commuting. And I recall that in the graded world, self-commuting vector field is a condition, right? Because it's a graded commutator. So it's not uh, Q applied to something twice uh, minus the same thing. It's minus the same thing with some sign in between. So in this case, it's just saying Q squares to zero. And you obviously remember or know or guessed that this is uh, nothing but a Dirac differential and the differential forms. Um, I'm saying this because this is actually a definition, the real definition of what people call a Q structure in the physics literature. So a degree one vector field that squares to zero uh, or in more mathematics oriented literature, people call this a differential structure and then the manifold would be differential graded. I think in this talk, I will systematically mix both of them. So typically algebras would be differential graded and manifolds would be Q manifolds. Also because Q algebras don't, do not sound right. Uh, yep, so this and uh, since I already pronounced the word category number of times, you should uh, probably define morphisms of these guys and morphisms are what you think they are. So you take two graded manifolds equipped with Q structures and you map one to another and you see how this, uh, how these Q structures behave with respect to that mapping. And the Q morphism is obviously when they sort of commute. Um, you take a, a 
arbitrary degree preserving map, it does not have to be a Q morphism, but there is always a canonical construction how to lift, how to extend the target manifold to the shifted tangent bundle to it and define your mapping in this on this diagonal in such a way that it becomes a Q morphism. Uh, I mean, it sounds a little bit folkloric, but I think one should actually cite maybe Alex say for that, right? So it's maybe in your paper with Thomas in your Q bundle paper. At least the proof that I saw was there, but maybe it was known before. So the upshot is that uh, uh, Q morphisms are very natural. And if your favorite map is not a Q morphism, you can still cook up a Q morphism out of it. And then there is also a notion of uh, Q homotopy, which is again, what you think it is, right? In the usual case, you would take a segment and you would uh, homotopy one thing to another. Now you want to stay in the good category, so you would probably replace a segment by shifted tangent bundle to it. But the construction is still the same. You have two, uh, two you have a family of maps, which on the one side of the segment gives you one of your favorite maps and on the other, the other one. And uh, yeah, this is a very natural construction. Now, uh, I promised you some physics. Uh, and physics actually comes from the problem of gauging. That's still your blackboard, Thomas. Uh, you remember from Thomas' talk yesterday, he was uh, writing some equations. Uh, so the, the thing he is now pointing at, or he used to point it yesterday, were the gauge transformations. And uh, you have seen in a lot of talks this week that all, very often you have like long formulas for equations of motion of your system, long formulas for gauge transformations. And uh, when the mathematician sees a formula which is more than two terms long, he says, no, that's, that's strange. There should be a structure in it. And the claim is actually that in good cases, and that is what Thomas said yesterday, in good cases, there is indeed a structure. And this structure is related to uh, some Lee infinity business. I guess we would hear from Alexander about it. Uh, but then there is a way to describe this Lee infinity business in terms of this graded manifolds and especially Q structures. So then uh, when you address the gauging problem, you would see that uh, equations of motion correspond precisely to Q morphisms and the, um, the symmetries correspond to Q homotopies. Um, and they can be parameterized easily in terms of uh, some vector fields on your graded manifold of appropriate degree. Now, what we did with Thomas and Alexei, we applied some of these constructions to the Dirac Sigma model. I'm not telling this story here, but this is just to say that I arrived to this very, uh, very mathematical construction from actually a concrete uh, physics problem motivated by this place. Okay. Yes, I had a joke on this, but it will come later. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, actually, you see all the all the quotes in the in the picture, and uh, these days it's not easy. Uh, now the second part, uh, well, you can actually more or less uh, state a theorem: uh, differential graded. Lie algebras can be integrated to differential graded Lie groups. No surprise. Um, the tricky point, the tricky thing is actually how to do it. Uh, and for this, I should probably remind a little bit the classical story. So uh, you all know that uh, Lie groups, uh, there is a Lie group Lie algebra correspondence, and there is a classical theorem that is. Uh, uh, misattributed to Lie, which is called the Lie's uh, third theorem, that every finite dimensional real Lie algebra is a Lie algebra of some simply connected Lie group. 
and it's an old statement. And there is a second statement that says that if you map two Lie algebras, one linear Lie algebra to another one, then you can also integrate this mapping to a homomorphisms of the corresponding Lie groups. Uh, you realize that this is a categorical statement, right? So you have objects, you integrate the objects, and you have morphisms, and you integrate them too. So this is, in a sense, an equivalence of categories uh, statement. And this uh, theorem, at some point, launched uh, an avalanche of uh, other works. So people started integrating all what is reasonable to integrate. I'm pretty sure that this is a non-exhaustive list because, you know, there are some particular cases, there are examples. So if someone who is in the room did some integration problem and he's not in the list, it's not to offend you, it's just uh, there are a lot of works. And, uh, okay, there are some simple statements, for example, the finite dimensionality property is important uh, the statement is false in the generic case, but true in some for some classes of cases, and this is uh, by Chen Chang and uh, Wackel. Then uh, you can uh, you can look at other algebraic constructions like Leibniz algebras, and they will be integrated to so-called Lie Rex. Uh, then uh, sometimes you do have abstractions to integrability, some kind of monodromic abstractions. Uh, and when they are absent, you can still integrate to something. Uh, the strategy is often that you would more or less define the object to which you integrate. I mean, let's make a poll in the audience, what is a LIRAC, right? Uh, and the only way to find, what, find out is probably read the paper. I mean, you, 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 you understand what is a Lie groupoid and the Lie algebraoid, but the, this is more uh, more an exceptional case. Most often, what you produce is something that is counterintuitive, and every integration problem is a kind of result on its own, and there is no general strategy. Um, now, what I promised would be uh, differential graded Lie algebras, and uh, that's, in a sense, simpler than most of those, but still surprisingly not that straightforward. Um, first of all, how do you do it in the very classical case? I'm not seeing the same thing as what you are seeing. Change. What do you see there? See the same thing, right? Interesting. Which, I mean, minus. Okay, let's try it again. Okay, now you don't see anything that makes sense. I used to. Sorry. Strange. I... Right. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I think it's... So, so, sorry, this... So what happened, he uh, asked me if I'm fine with recording. Okay. Yo, so when you do the classical story, so again, you are back to real uh, finite dimensional Lie algebras, uh, the standard proof is you uh, look at your Lie algebra as a sub algebra of uh, the matrix, G of the matrix algebra GLN, and then you integrate it with an exponential map. The usual story that you probably some of you teach to students. And then to integrate the morphisms, you use the baker campbell hausdorff formula. So basically, you are solving these exponential equations. And also, I think it's a familiar, it's a familiar construction, like non-commutative things, non-commuting things. You would first have a sign of them and then a lot of brackets. Uh, 
This does not work in the graded case. Well, I don't know. It doesn't work, and nobody tried, or someone tried. But I mean, already this this uh, embedding in the GLN uh, doesn't look uh, doesn't look nice. And what actually work works is uh, some kind of alternative approach, which is also, by the way, in Wikipedia. Uh, what you are supposed to look at is the uh, algebras on your uh, is the algebra of functions on your group, and then you define some hop algebra structure on it, uh, and you identify this hop algebra by some classical some classical theorems like Milner Moore uh, to the uh, universal envelope algebra of your the algebra, and then you would see the correspondence. Uh, this uh, this uh, sounds like something that can survive uh, adding the word graded at each step. So this is the picture that Alexei sent to me yesterday, and I will pretend so there is uh, that it's in Russian and there is a word integrate but with a typo. So I tried to I mean Leonid translated it with a typo. Um, I pretend that uh, Alexei didn't mean anything personal, and uh, he will pretend that I didn't understand whom he meant. <laughs> and people who know the story, they know who, who, who we are talking about. But uh, okay, the message is that if someone says, okay, this looks like it should survive the graded uh, word in all the steps, uh, is most probably a little bit wrong. In the sense that you see it's a Wikipedia article and some of the links I have clicked on them. So you click on the Milamore theorem and you look at the statement. You say, okay, most of the parts will still survive the edit of editing of the graded word, but not all of them. And then you click to another layer, and then at some point you end up in some very, very technical problem. Uh, of just the definition of what you are doing, um, it is correct, it works, but you need to make it work out. And the coming 10 minutes, I would explain you how this would work out, but also I will give you the other ingredients. So we agreed that we want differential graded Lie algebras. That slide was about just graded Lie algebras and the differential graded Lie algebras, you need to, uh, again, in the classical case, think of what could be the analog of your Q structure. And the analog of Q, Q structure is obviously just a vector field with no conditions on it. Uh, and this is something that also works. So uh, you look at uh, what is called multiplicative vector fields. Uh, the vector fields that are related to themselves using the multiplication operation, right? Um, and in your integration procedure, you want to keep track of that, right? You have something that is acting in the group on the algebra, and they, they have somehow to talk to each other. Uh, the way to make them talk to each other is called Van Est isomorphism. I'm giving you the pieces of the puzzle. I'm really not giving you details, but if you piece them all together, you will get the complete picture. So what this, uh, what you should use is the so-called Van Est isomorphism that says that uh, uh, it is good to look at uh, some uh, co-cycles uh, instead of this multiplicative vector fields. And the first step, you would say that actually there is a one-to-one -one correspondence in a sense between the multiplicative vector fields and some co-cycles in the appropriate in the appropriate spaces, right? Both for for the Lie groups and for the the algebras, and then uh, the isomorphism would tell you that they are all related. And again, this is a classical picture. This is an absolutely not graded business, but it goes to the graded world verbatim, like out of the box. Yes, so multiplicative vector fields, 
you, so you just have a category of manifolds with selected vector fields. This is a simple thing, right? Just you, and morphisms would push forward vector fields to other vector fields. And then you have a mapping, right? X times X to X, which is a multiplication. And you want your vector field to be related. So you, you, you define what is the vector fields that are F related, and this is just that, right? This kind of P is the tangent map. And then multiplicative vector fields are supposed to be related in this in this sense. So somehow you have vector fields that are compatible with multiplication. Okay? But as mentioned, this is not a convenient thing, not a convenient thing to work with. The more convenient thing is to uh, to work with some co-cycles and this this construction precisely says that like you have rather kind of differential forms business than the vector field business. Okay, so now, now it kind of seems that we have all the necessary ingredients. We're able to integrate uh, Lie algebras to Lie groups. We're able to integrate differential Lie algebras to differential Lie groups and graded Lie algebras to graded Lie groups. That's more or less true. So this is the place. This is actually the place where someone comes to you and says, integrate. Um, so the vector field is not complicated. This just works with no modific modifications. Uh, the Hopf algebra business, you need to do some technicalities, but they also work. And for the moment, I still didn't tell you what is actually the object. So what is this mysterious thing that we will define as the intermediary step between the algebras and the groups? Um, so the Hopf business, if you know the Hopf algebras, then this is just the usual picture you would see, right? You have uh, you have some multiplication and some co-multiplication, and they talk to each other with a bunch of axioms. You want to define graded Hopf algebras. It's precisely that, up to some links that you click. And these warning signs are actually related to mostly to the end of my talk. So how you define functional spaces on graded manifolds. And for example, the tricky point is that instead of just taking the tensor products of graded manifolds, you should complete these tensor products. Uh, like think of uh, products of two manifolds and you look at functions on this product, it is not always the product of of, it doesn't always split into product, but it is a uh, maybe a series of this of this splitted products. The same thing happens in the graded world, and you actually do need this because you need to show some properties of this of the spaces. Like, is it fresh air? Is it nuclear? Or is it does it have some some, some usual analytic properties? And in the classical case, that would be a textbook of 1950s and in the graded case it will still be the textbook of 1950s but it will not be written there so you'll have to to, to go through the proof yourself again uh, and now the last piece of the puzzle is probably the most important one and i think that was the idea of alexei some maybe 10 years ago right maybe you should know at some point <laughs> that you don't go directly from groups to algebra so the other way around. You go through a construction which is called the graded Harris-Chandra pair uh, because actually looking at the Lie algebra of the graded Lie algebra itself doesn't give you enough structure. You need somehow to distinguish what happens on the base and what happens on the graded components. Uh, and the graded Harris Chandra pairs is uh, is uh, a couple, uh, the degree zero part of your group and the whole graded Lie algebra. So the kind of morally the integration procedure is you would integrate what happens in degree zero with the classical tools. You would understand what is the what is the degree zero part of your gradedly group, 
And then you will use it again to uh, quotient out what happens on the graded directions. And then you, you need also an extra piece of structure, which is a representation from uh, this uh, degree zero part to the whole Lie algebra uh, that again satisfies some compatibility relations. That in the classical case, I would say so, then maybe super case, we should quote him and a little bit Lisa. Vishnikova and graded. I think it's you. Don't be don't be modest. Uh, so th this these are the objects and the morphisms. Are again, what you think they are. So just all the things in the game are supposed to survive the mappings. Um, yeah. Now that's kind of it. Now integrated. You look at the universal enveloping algebra of your graded Lie algebra, you look at the universal enveloping algebra of the degree zero part of it, uh, and you look at how they talk to each other, uh, then you use the same approach as uh, before for the classical case in the Hopf algebra business, but now your Hopf algebra would be defined on this bigger space. Uh, Obviously, you need to check a lot of uh, technical details, but uh, finally, you would again apply the same correspondence and you would get uh, some pretty explicit construction of this Hopf algebra. And this slide is also not really supposed to be read because it's, it's uh, well, it's technical. It's just here to say it can be done. And the main statement is this, right? There is an equivalence of categories between non-negatively graded Lie groups and non-negatively graded harish chandler pairs. And then, at least on the object level, you are done, right? So you have three things in the game, algebras, pairs, and groups, and they all are equivalent. Um, and there is just the differential part missing. And this is again in the same spirit of uh, uh, co-cycle business. So you would define it. This is also Alexei's construction, I would say. You would define the uh, the one co-cycle on G0 valued in the appropriate space that will be somehow compatible with the representation you had in the uh, harris chan repairs. Uh, you don't really need to read this. I mean, that's what uh, you could read in the paper, but on the slide, it's kind of difficult to understand. Uh, and then the result is what you expect. So there is an equivalence of categories between differential graded Lie algebras, differential graded harish chan repairs, and graded differential graded Lie groups. Now, if you really want details, this is the paper. And I advise you to read not the published version, but the archive version, because it is more detailed. For some reason, the referee decided that we should drop out all the classical results on which I actually stand, spent the most part of this talk. Uh, and we left them only in the archive version. By the way, if the referee is by chance in the room, I would like to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> No, that was, a, okay, the joke is that it's a paper that was written in whatever, six years and with different people who have never been in the same room back in the days when it was not yet the fashion. So at some point, the referee was probably the one who, is, who was understanding the paper better than all of us. <laughs> so yeah, if the paper, if the referee is here, I do want to talk to him. And I think I also had some other joke. On the, what did I offer to people who cite this paper, Leonid? Do you remember the last time I talked about it? Yes, that's. <laughs> that may be a beer too. I think that was that. Yeah, okay, so the integration business. Uh, you have probably noticed, but were too shy to ask, that I'm all, at some point I definitely switched to end grading. I, 
the beginning I was kind of juggling that and then, and now I switched to end grading. And this is actually a natural question. Is it really important that the uh, grading is non-negative, non-positive, it's more or less the same? Um, the short answer is that there was just a technicality related to the Poincaré-Birkhoff-Witt theorem that worked out of the box for the n-graded and that needed some efforts uh, for the z-graded case. And if you do this, this kind of graded geometry, you could imagine why it needs some effort because you need to order some basis of some algebra and when you have a natural ordering of the coordinates, then it goes well. And if you have some positive and negative degrees, I will come to it uh, right now, uh, then it's a little bit more complicated. We first thought of making just a remark on it, and then we realized that we could maybe write a pedagogic text on this. And this uh, text was supposed to be online yesterday, but Alexei Strain got late. <laughs> So it will appear some in some very near future on the on the archive. I will tell you some beginning of that text because again there are a lot of technical details. But conceptually, uh, I want to explain what is the crucial difference between n graded and z graded. Um, and there, this is a real definition now. So I'm trying to not wave hands, you see I'm holding here. Uh, this is how you actually define the graded manifold. You say that, uh, that there is some shift on function which functions which is locally modeled as smooth functions on the, on the base, on the uh, neighborhood on the base. And there is some kind of long, uh, long sequence of uh, vector spaces that are responsible for the gradings. And you see there are index indices up and down. Uh, the lower index is the degree of the respected, respective uh, coordinate and the upper index is the dimension of that subspace. So locally it looks like a, uh, a, an open neighbor neighborhood with uh, a lot of vector spaces attached to it with labeled by some degrees and you see this this uh, series intentionally doesn't stop in both directions uh, in uh, the easy examples it does stop but if you want to do general theory you have to kind of kind of take all of them into account um, maybe just the some remarks we tried to read some literature on it and we found a lot of words that people use to describe particular cases of it for example there is a very uh, there is a very established thing of saying that the graded manifold is a finite degree it means that this series actually stops so there are no generators of degrees higher than something and lower than something and for example, you will see in uh, uh, Sasha's talk uh, in half an hour that degree one and manifolds with a Q structure, they correspond to Lie algebraids. Um, now, if uh, the series doesn't stop, you can still ask for something. You can, for example, say that uh, all the vector spaces are of finite dimension. And uh, all of all these conditions, they produce some kind of interesting functional spaces. Uh, we tried to take the minimalistic version of it and see what happens. Uh, for example, you can look at manifolds of finite graded dimension. What it means that uh, in the graded components, you are finite dimensions, but on the smooth component, you, everything can happen. And it seems that it is a closed category. So if you map one, if you map two manifolds of such type between each other, you get again the manifold. The, the space of mappings would be uh, of this type. Um, you include infinite dimensional base, and this is something that saves the day. We will see right after that it actually follows from a more general fact. Okay, Thomas is now sleeping, so I need to do something. Uh, um, yes, I'm, I, it's probably not very useful to discuss this precise 
kind of stupid category for two reasons. First, it's not very fun. And second, uh, physicists would say it's too small. Like for uh, what Alberto is doing in BV, this would not uh, host all the things he needs to host. Then we looked at the most general thing, but still finite dimension in all the components. Uh, and we tried to understand what, how would you construct the function space there. So now I am of finite degree and I'm of finite dimension everywhere. And I want to see what is the, uh, what is the nice functional space on it. Uh, obviously you can say I take formal power series and everything, uh, and which is true, but I want to have some more structure in it. And I will just walk you through uh, two or three propositions uh, saying how you could construct this space. So the first thing you do, obviously, you would take polynomials in non-zero degree variables with smooth coefficients of degree zero variables like you would do in super geometry or n-graded geometry. But here you understand that the series do not have to stop, right? So if I if I uh, do super geometry or if I do n graded geometry, at some point I would run into uh, run into repetitions of the coordinates, and if the anti commuting, they will obviously vanish. Um, now, if I have um, positive and negative degrees, I can eventually produce a degree zero combination of non uh, near potent elements uh, and then plug it into a smooth function. So what this proposition says is that if I just take polynomial functions of degrees of non-zero degree coordinates with uh, smooth coefficients, this does not survive coordinate changes, right? Well, this is what is written. Uh, so you need to extend it somehow and the natural way to extend it is now you would take finite combinations of formal power series, no, now not polynomials, but uh, the, uh, the formality would be only in the degree zero, right? This is what I'm writing. Right, so you allow kind of uh, series in the combinations of variables that in total produce degree zero, and all which is outside is of non-zero degree. You, you see the difference, right? Before I didn't allow this. Before I allowed only real degree zero uh, variables. And then the uh, statement is this is actually stable with respect to the same coordinate changes. And the proof would be to say I uh, would gradually open the brackets and try to put all the degree, all the non-zero degrees on one side and all the others in the inside the brackets. And as soon as I recover the, the series in degree zero coordinates, I would say, okay, what is the function? What is the smooth function for which this is a Taylor series? And this is the Borel's theorem. So you would construct this in, in, the, in that way. And now the statement, the general statement is even stronger uh, this uh, space that looks slightly exotic actually generates all the power series and uh, it uh, when you when you first say it it looks kind of weird because one looks kind of much bigger than the other one but actually it is not the case and the proof is a simple uh, kind of discrete linear algebra statement. So you want to uh, produce uh, a function of some fixed degree. And now I have, as mentioned, I have negative and positive degrees in the game. I will split them in two. So size are, for instance, positive and size are negative. And then saying that, that my function is of given degrees, that they are powers talk in the appropriate way. So we reduce this uh, decomposition problem to uh, an integer coefficients, integer number equation, the classical D of one time thing that you, for two variables you, you learned in high school, right? 
with uh, Euclid's division algorithm. But now you are in, in a bigger dimensional space and you want only positive solutions on that. And actually this is a well-studied thing and we kind of surprisingly came into it from some computer algebra constructions. But the theory behind this, uh, again, 60, 60 years old, saying that a commutative monoid and the space of solutions of it is a commutative monoid would be generated by a finite basis. And this finite basis would be precisely the monomials that you would factor out of this degree zero series. Okay? So the upshot, we started with polynomials, we, we understood that it was not enough. Then we allowed some exotic power series of degree zero coordinates that turned out to be stable. And that also turned out to generate the whole space. Now, as supposed, I have almost taken my 50 minutes. Uh, there is, uh, there are, two big chapters that are, uh, that are good to tell at this point, but they would take each probably half an hour. Uh, first, uh, that looks like a very coordinate dependent uh, construction. There is a way to do it more intrinsically. And uh, this is what we are now writing up using some filtrations of some graded algebras, ideas, and all this business. Uh, the tricky point is that now, obviously, the filtrations should go in two directions, and they should somehow talk to each other. And the other important point in the category business would be to discuss morphisms. And this is, again, uh, on the first on the first uh, side, it looks like a simple generalization of the n-graded case. But when you deep, go deeper into it, there are things to say. I think it's kind of the legal time to stop, right? So this at some point will appear on the archive, or maybe at some point someone would tell it in the coming days. <laughs> I don't know. And I guess I stop here. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for the lecture. Are there any questions or comments? Okay, that's, yeah, that's interesting. No, 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 it's, it's, it, it means that I was not clear. So you, you, you understand how you relate vector fields, right? Just maps between manifolds and push forwards, for example, by the tangent map. Huh? Or, or the dual language, yes. So you look at the, uh, the derivations and you more or less have this Q-morphism property, right? So you pull back functions. First, you apply the vector field pull back or if it's, okay, if I write the online people don't see it, so. No, but the, this, the, there are two different vector fields that are acting. You can first differentiate then pull back or you first pull back and then differentiate. And this is supposed to commute. Right? Or you can look at the same map and push forward the vector. So this is again this, and this is classical differential geometry. Nothing really, nothing really exceptional. Now you have a particular mapping, right, from uh, each group times group to itself, and then you have uh, in, on each step you have on, on each part you have a vector field that you push it forward. On G times G you have a product vector field. Right. You kind of sum vector field, right? So, so you, uh, have, you have a vector field then on, on G. Then you take a divot product of G with G, you have a product vector field, right? On, on the product. Yeah, and I, then there is a multiplication map and it relates with the yeah, okay. I'm, I'm willing to say sum, right? <laughs> and this sum goes to, 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 to one. 
Yeah, yeah, some of the product we have to put. call this some of the like product. product yeah, sounds yeah. structure seems to. Yeah, so, so sounds convincing. <laughs> sounds correct at least. <laughs> yeah, so it's actually yeah. also doing some diagonals at the same time. Yeah, well, there are also a lot of them in the game, and also in the core product business. Uh, yes, how constructive is the uh, relation between DGLA and DGLG? So, can I take uh, gradient infinitesimal symmetries of Thomas and compute uh, DGLG associated? Yes, I, to I totally bless you for that. Yes. <laughs> no, okay, good question actually. There are some uh, very natural examples where you sort of know the answer and you do recover the answer with it. Uh, it is maybe indeed a good exercise to take your favorite uh, differential graded Lie algebra and see what it gives in the differential graded Lie group. And uh, may maybe, maybe like very simple things with one generator could be, could be instructive, or two generators mm, commuting or not commuting. So, yeah, that's. That, that, that are probably the exercises that we are organizing to do. You, you kind of expect the answer, but yeah, yeah it's, it's uh, interesting to figure out. Any questions? Uh, maybe just to clarify, probably I miss some important parts. So you arrive at a differential graded Lie group in algebraic terms as a graded version of Hopkins algebra. Yes, so, so what I wanted to ask is to maybe can you repeat or maybe give more geometrical insight into the definition of differential grade mm -hmm. Because well, somehow it was really just missed the differential because it is important piece and it is yeah, you, you, you get pure algebraic. Yeah, yeah, but these are two. Uh, it's like two different questions. So first, you would construct the Hopf chain on the large channel. That's that, that's the non-trivial stuff. Right? Now, just for differential graded groups, I would say geometrically or group object in the differential yeah, manifold. Uh, 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 what is the differential grid? What is the differential grid? Yeah, you're being yeah, so <laughs> take, 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 take a group object in it. Or you want an example. Do we have an example? Definition is a group object there. So something that. Okay, I, I, I have differential graded. Yeah. Okay. It means it's a graded manifold, yeah. it graded. Yes. Graded yes. Graded. yes, and you have a Plus multiplication method. Right. And you said that your structure is graded multiplicative with respect to this uh, multiplication. But it's a Q manifold with groups. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Compatible. And in in this Q is like. Is, is, uh, yes. Yes. Ah, okay. Hey, I'm just a I think all the geometry is hidden in the zero degree. And uh, the rest is more or less a bundle of the zero degree. That's how it looks like. Yeah, this I understand, of course. And also, that's the question about geometry. And also, I mean, the abstractions are eventually hidden them, but we know that there are no abstractions because, right? And what you do upstairs is more or less sorting the basis of uh, subspaces. Okay, thank you. Maybe I'll ask later to take time. 